In this video, I'd like to talk with you about the concept of style, literary style. And to do this, we'll have a look at this essay by Malcolm Gladwell, the prolific essayist and writer. You may have read his some of his books, including Outliers, or more recently, David and Goliath. Uh, or you may have listened to his podcast, Revisionist History. And he's a very good writer, but he also has a particular style. And so we'll use him as a sort of test case to, to think about the concept of style. Now, there is this saying that clothes make the man, right? And you can say something similar about style. Uh, I want you to be able to recognize that, that different writers have unique kinds of writing styles. Uh, another quotation that, that kind of gets at this point is one from the 18th century literary critic, Alexander Pope. And Pope once wrote that true wit, true kind of wittiness and intelligence and and being smart and so on. True wit is nature to advantage dressed, what oft was thought but never so well expressed. In other words, people might have had the same idea, but they've never seen it expressed so well. And so part of writing is simply the expression, the way in which you bring ideas forward. Let's have a look then at what Malcolm Gladwell has to say. We'll just look at it at the opening mostly uh, and try to get a little bit of a sense of the stylistic ticks that, that make his writing work. Okay, so he starts by writing at 4.30 in the afternoon on Monday, February 1, 1960, four college students sat down at the lunch counter at the Woolworths in downtown Greensboro, North Carolina. Whew, that's a lot of details. Do we need that many details to get at this story? Um, especially since most of the story, as we find out later, is about social media today. So this is a little introductory story, and we sort of wonder, well, do we need that much detail? But there's a point to this. What Gladwell is trying to get across is that there is a kind of delight in knowledge, that simply facts can... can um, not simply entertain us, but give us a sense of satisfaction, a sense of knowing or being in the know, that we have done research, that we are reading something that's meticulous. And so the meticulous nature of this, that's the kind of stylistic feature that's coming across, okay? One fact after another. Does it matter? Well, maybe not, but it does create a certain effect. The next sentence continues, they were freshmen at North Carolina A&T, a black college a mile or so away. Now this sentence, what this sentence does is it starts with that kind of factual approach again, but then the last little bit is much more casual, a mile or so away, right? I mean, if he, if he wanted to be exact, he could have given you the exact kilometer mark or mile mark, right? It wouldn't be that difficult to do, but why doesn't he do that? because he's trying to seem casual here. He's trying to do two things at once. He wants to be savvy and smart and, uh, and so on, and then he also wants to seem casual and on your side, right? And that's why a lot of people, when they read Gladwell, they find him actually a bit smug sounding sometimes. And, and this is a little bit of the style of the New Yorker, that kind of urbane style where, where the writers are trying to seem you know, suave and elegant and, and both um, witty and knowledgeable and all of these things at the same time. And that can come across as a little bit annoying at this, uh, as well. So he continues, he, he writes, I'd like a cup of coffee, please. One of the four, Easel Blair, said to the waitress. Do we need to know his name? I don't know. Uh, we don't serve Negroes here, she replied. The Woolworths lunch counter was a long L-shaped bar that could seat 66 people with a stand-up snack bar at one end. <laughs> Does that matter? I mean, that detail is completely irrelevant to the rest of the story. But again, there's this sort of delight in just giving you these facts, right? 66 people, exactly. I mean, who really cares? The seats were for whites, the snack bar was for blacks. And then we read on. So I think you can start to get a little bit of a sense now of, of the kind of writing style here. But we're going to dig in a little bit more and try to get at um, grammatically what makes these sentences tick. One of the things that you'll notice uh, is that these sentences are typically quite short. Right, The seats were for whites, the snack bar was for blacks. Even when they are longer, the sentence structure is quite simple. Uh, a lot of these sentences are simple sentences. They don't actually have a lot of dependent clauses. 
um, a lot of these sentences, if they do add information, it's mostly in phrases and not in dependent clauses. Now you, you can go through the article and see that this plays out quite consistently, I think. If you look at the, the subjects of the sentences, they are also quite typically quite straightforward. So the first one, uh, four college students, right? There's our subject. Uh, then we have, they were freshmen, they, um, the next one, one of the four said, right? So one of the four is, is the subject. Uh, she replied, she is the subject, or we don't serve Negroes, we is the subject. Uh, we have the lunch counter is the subject, the seats, the snack bar. Almost all the subjects are just two or three words at the most. And so that makes it very easy to read, even if we have all of these other details tacked on. Same thing with the verbs. The main verbs are typically very straightforward. So if you go through through this, it says uh, sat in the first sentence. Um, uh, they were, so were. Uh, we have I'd like, said, sir, we don't serve, uh, replied, um, you know, was. And one interesting thing here is that there's a lot of actually linking verbs here, uh, like was and were and so on. And in an academic essay, a lot of people would tend to stay away from those because if you have too many, you know, is and was and were and so on, uh, people might accuse you of not being very exact. You might say, for instance, the seats were reserved for whites or the snack bar was meant only for blacks, right? But Malcolm Gladwell's fine with that. And that's because he... Um, he does create that little bit more of a casual effect and he feels that there's enough detail here that this can uh, sustain itself and that we don't necessarily need those more specific verbs and that, that's fine. So that is something to think about then as you write your sentences. Can you reduce the sentence to a simple subject and a simple verb and build it up from there? You don't have to do that of course all the time but it is something to be really conscious of in terms of style. Another thing to notice um, as well is that Malcolm Gladwell rarely uses what are called expletives. And by expletives, we don't mean swear words here. We mean these phrases that start with there was or there is or it, it is or it was. Um, he doesn't do that because those are very weak phrases, right? I mean, he could have said there were seats that were reserved for whites. But no, he picks a simple subject, the seats, and runs with that. So watch out for expletives in your own writing. Try not to start with these kinds of uh, weak kinds of phrases. Another th thing to think about is to vary the length of your sentences. And you can see here that some of these sentences are very short. And the effect of that is to really speed up the process of reading. A short sentence acts like a kind of pause or a, a breath, right? Breath, breath of fresh air. So think of your sentence uh, of your reader as having to breathe as he or she reads your piece, and those short sentences allow the reader to kind of catch up and process things and then speed up again. So pace and rhythm and and breathing these things really matter in writing, and try to vary your sen sentence length. Uh, another thing to think about is that if you are using, um, you know, more complicated sentences, you may want to think about creating some sense of structure that works. And one thing you can do, for instance, is to, to create a parallel sense of structure. So if we read here, it says, when 10,000 protesters took to the streets in Moldova in the spring of 2009 to protest against their country's communist government, the action was dubbed the Twitter revolution because of the means by which the demonstrators had been brought together. That, I mean, that's a very complex sentence, right? It starts with when this, then we have that, and then we have because. So the main clause here is the action was dubbed the Twitter revolution. Okay, so when this, then the action was dubbed, and then the last bit is because. Now notice what the next sentence does, is it follows the same structure. It says, a few months after that, when student protests rocked Tehran, so there's the when bit, when this happened, then we get our main clause. The State Department took the unusual step of asking Twitter to suspend scheduled maintenance of its website, and then we get the because clause at the very end. So we call that really parallel structure, right? We want these, these sentences to be quite similar, and it works very effectively here. Something to think about, but also think about what is in each clause. Because if you, if you tie together dependent and 
independent clauses, you really want to have um, your key ideas preferably in the main clause. And you can see here that the Twitter bit is in each instance in the main clause. So that is the focus of the attention. Although if you add too many dependent clauses, then you run the risk of actually taking the attention away from that. Uh, and so you have to be careful about kind of weighing the balance between independent and dependent clauses. The other thing to think about is the order, right? The order of um, information. And you, you want to be aware that if you put your crucial bits way at the end of a sentence, um, that can have a powerful effect in terms of ending with something clima climactic, but it also delays what's important. And if you do that too much, then the reader is going to struggle to, to really follow your ideas. There are lots more things we could say about style, but let's hope that this gets the point across that style matters, that style is uh, sort of related to personality, and that if you want to come across in a certain way, then you also want to develop a, a style that's somewhat consistent and that fits with who you want to, to be, basically, when it comes to writing.